Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's uh, virtual morning prayer. Uh, this Sunday is uh, the Sunday of our annual meeting and we are celebrating this morning the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Uh, the annual meeting will be uh, immediately following the service. Before we get to that, uh, I want to say a couple of other things about uh, events upcoming, including next Sunday uh, when Vicki Gottlob, who is a, uh, a member of our uh, adult formation committee, will, uh, will introduce us following the service, uh, for those of you who'd like to join us, uh, to, the, uh, to the Sacred Ground Program, which is a, a small group uh, program developed by the Episcopal Church nationally uh, to focus on race and reconciliation. So uh, Vicki will be leading uh, the small ground, um, the <laughs> small group, not small ground, small groups uh, of, of this through the sacred ground series uh, in this spring. And she's going to introduce that next Sunday. So I hope many of you will want to uh, learn more about that and decide whether or not um, you would like to participate. Two weeks from today, following the service, uh, we will have uh, a comprehensive update um, on uh, the, the outlook for 2021 at St. Paul's, including our uh, building restoration and building plans, our capital campaign plans, our organ restoration plan, our program plans for the end of COVID, uh, much more than, uh, than we could ever fit into our today's annual meeting. So uh, I'm offering that to, uh, to give you a, uh, just a little warning that when we get to our annual meeting today, uh, we will not have time to discuss um, all of those uh, all of those exciting things that are upcoming. We will point to them and remind ourselves that they are coming and we'll get back to them in two weeks. Uh, the annual meeting, we will need to uh, elect new vestry members. We will need to hear some reports about 2020. And if we have some time at the end, we may have a little bit of question and answer, but I um, just want to assure you that there will be a much fuller discussion uh, of where we're headed together in the new year. Um, two weeks from today following the service. So that's uh, that's next week and that's today. And when we get to our closing hymn and postlude today, uh, the link for the annual meeting will be in the chat box uh, on, this, on this call if you would like to join us for the annual meeting. Uh, and you also should have the link to the annual meeting in the same email that you got uh, that had the link to this, uh, to this service. So, uh, shouldn't be hard to find your way to the annual meeting, and it will be in the chat um, at the end of the service. The annual meeting will begin at 11 o'clock, and we expect it to last uh, approximately 45 minutes. Um, for this morning, I want especially to thank Lucy Bird Pego, who made a beautiful flower arrangement, uh, which you will have to trust is now gracing the chapel at St. Paul's. Um, adorning our worship from afar. I walked out this morning at about eight o'clock and kicked the slush and ice around in my street uh, after the sun had come up and decided not to drive over there to sit by the flowers or bring the flowers here, uh, but they are there. Uh, and we thank Lucy Bird for arranging them. Uh, also this morning, uh, the, we have um, largely due to miscommunication, which was my fault within the staff, we've got a couple of errors in the bulletin we are celebrating the conversion of St. Paul. Uh, the only reason you might need to know that is in order to participate in the psalm, uh, we will be reading Psalm 67, uh, which is on page 675, uh, which is different from what's in the bulletin. So our service of morning prayer begins in the prayer book on page 80 or in your bulletin. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. We'll sing Canticle 13, S236 this morning. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers.
glory to you in the splendor of your temple, on the throne of your majesty, glory to you, glory to you, seated between the cherubim, we will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Psalm 67 is on page 675 in the Book of Common Prayer. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth her increase. May God, our own God, give us his blessing. May God give us his blessing and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. Paul said to King Agrippa, indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem with authority received from the chief priests. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme and since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. When at midday along the road, your excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goats. I asked, who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose to anoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do deeds consistent with repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Here ends the reading. Hymn 255. God's 
A reading from Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and put them to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Here ends the reading. Last year at the annual meeting, you might remember me running around the parish hall in a bobcut sparkly silver wig, <laughs> carrying boxes of pizza from the kitchen to the youth group table. Um, trying to convince all of you to sign up for a chili cook-off along the way. It was a fun night and a crazy night and being new to all of that, it was just marvelous. And I can't believe that was um, a little, that was a year ago and that we haven't been together for almost that long. When we were preparing for that 2020 annual meeting. I learned that in years past, the youth group had gone upstairs to a room by themselves away from the rest of the party. And I pushed hard that year to unsettle that routine and to find some way to squeeze their table into the parish hall because I was new and I was excited. And in my newness and my excitement, I was hoping to see how things might change. I could see in front of me all of the possibilities for the youth at St. Paul's and I wanted to proclaim a new identity for them. An identity, identity that reflected their importance to this community that brought them to the center I wanted them to feel known and loved and prioritized. I wanted to claim a place for them at the table, literally. When I was asked to get imaginative and create a table for the middle and high schoolers that night, I thought no problem, 70s wigs it is. It was noisy, chaotic, and colorful. And amid the chaos and the pews of our church, a group of middle school girls clad in pink, blue, and yellow wigs decided to start a group text with one another. And this is no small feat in youth ministry, a tangible sign of community being formed. 
The annual meeting is scheduled to fall in line with the feast of the conversion of St. Paul every January. Every year we read about that moment of blinding light on the road to Damascus. Every year we remember and celebrate the story of our namesake. And this year, as we remember our story without the usual celebrations in tow, I wonder if we might also ask ourselves, what is the identity we are choosing to proclaim? What community are we forming? And at this particular turning point, what do we mean when we say that we are St. Paul's church? The first time we meet Paul is in Acts chapter seven, where he is anything but a saint. Paul is participating in a dramatic and violent scene, not just participating in, but overseeing the stoning of a man named Stephen. Stephen has just given a lengthy, highly critical sermon, and those listening are agitated to the point of transforming into a mob. In the words of Acts, they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, they all rushed together against him. Outnumbered and overpowered, Stephen is dragged out of the city and stoned to death. And we are told that the witnesses lay their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. The text goes on to say that Saul, or as we know him, Paul, ravaged the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, committing them to prison. Stoning, ravaging, dragging, imprisoning. Pre-conversion Paul is not just the uncle we would have argued with at the dinner table. He is the one we would have refused to eat dinner with, the guy we would have protested, the person who is so certain that his way is the right way that he is willing to do harm to make it so, the leader who incites a violent mob to keep things as they are, who will do whatever it takes to avoid having to change. This is our patron St. Paul. In all of his fear and rage and violence and persecution, Paul stood for everything Jesus stood against and still he becomes our guy. Sure. The fact that Paul more than perfect claims God set our Paul is beloved and always has not for his violence and ignorance but in spite of it Paul has always been chosen and on the road to Damascus he finally turns to God to see this truth for himself and in that turning he is indeed transformed his jagged edges are formed into something entirely new. Perhaps then this is what we are called to believe as St. Paul's church, that the grace and the love of God is for everyone, literally. Luke, the writer of Acts, tells the story of Paul's conversion three times throughout the book, recounting the same story over and over and over again with the same sense of wonder and miraculous encounter each time. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions, Paul proclaims. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Get up, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen in me and to those in which I will appear to you. I am sending you out to the people so that they may turn, so that they may turn from darkness to light. This is what conversion is like. It is not turning over a new leaf, trying a little bit harder, making a new year's resolution. It is a bright blinding light that invites us to turn to new life. It is God showing up in the most unlikely places to show us the way out of the darkness. In spite of the fears, the inconveniences and uncertainties that arise, it is us dropping everything and turning to the way of love, turning to face the God to whom we have always belonged. What does this look like? What does this mean? How do I do it? 
Most of us, well, I think all of us scramble for some easier answers when confronted with this really difficult call to change. Like Paul, we are struck to the ground when confronted with the injustices, the shame, the losses, and the broken relationships the light reveals. When we turn on the lights and we see the mess, we're overwhelmed by the need for change and radical change at that. And we wring our hands and we ask one another, what should I do? What can I do? We could and probably have had an entire adult formation series on this wandering alone. I think we all know what turning metanoia repentance really looks like. But even if I would rather talk about it, even I would rather talk about it than proclaim it. Because I know that this turning cannot mean business as usual anymore, and that's terrifying. I know that the kind of turning Paul invites us to participate in requires that we walk away from our lives as they are. You are out of your mind, Paul. Paul's accuser calls out to him as he's telling his story. Too much learning is driving you insane, he says. Paul replies, I am not out of my mind. I am speaking the sober truth. I speak freely because I am certain. I speak freely because I am certain this is the way, the truth, and the life. Giving away one coat when we have two, devoting not just our Sundays, but our lives to the proclamation of the gospel, forming some sort of radical community that doesn't conform to the performance-based, capital-driven ways of the world, risking comfort, wealth, and ease for communion, and above all, embracing a terrifying and extraordinary freedom in Christ. It sounds intense and incredibly difficult to me. As humans, we are programmed to resist change, and yet as Christians, we are called to embrace it which is why the gospel was never meant to be proclaimed alone, which is why Paul was transformed precisely so that he could go out and form community. We cannot be church on our own. So who are we as St. Paul's church? We are a community called together to proclaim freely, boldly, and certainly the good news of life in Christ. We are a community called together to embody the good news that everything under the bright light of the sun is beloved by God. To believe that we are chosen, to allow ourselves to be transformed, to bend to the light of justice, to give ourselves to the turning over and over and over again. This past year has cracked us open as individuals, as families, as the church, as the world, we are cracked open and we have a choice to make. We can scramble together to gather up the pieces and glue them back, hoping that maybe no one will notice we broke in the first place. Or we can open to new life, to new light, to entirely new ways of being the body of Christ. We can let our broken pieces show us what was missing all along. And we can come together to build something extraordinary from the jagged edges. In the words of Amanda Gorman, who every preacher has been quoting across our nation these past few weeks, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful when day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unfrayed. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it. Amen.
You're invited to pray silently or aloud the affirmation of faith that's printed in, in the bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to the church. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O God, by the preaching of your apostle Paul, you have caused the light of the gospel to shine throughout the world Grant, we pray, that we, having his wonderful conversion and remembrance, may show ourselves thankful to you by following his holy teaching. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, whose son had nowhere to lay his head, grant that those who live alone may not be lonely in their solitude, but that following in his steps, they may find fulfillment in loving you and their neighbors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the depths of winter darkness, we pray to you, O God, make us children of the light. In a world needing new songs of joy and love, we pray to you, O God, make us children of the light. When our anger, frustration, and fear blind us to the ways of love, we pray to you, O God, make us children of the light. For those who stand between where we are and the world you desire, we pray to you, O God, make us children of the light. As we hear creation groan for restoration and freedom, we pray to you, O God, make us children of the light. We remember in prayer all of those on our parish prayer list. We pray for those who have died, for Jeffrey Latham Maddox and Muriel Jean Ogilvie. I invite your prayers of thanksgiving and petition silently or aloud. O oh God, who created all peoples in your image, we thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love 
is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus, Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Amazing Grace, and that is number 671. So despite what it says in the bulletin, 671. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.